Get excited. Take off your pants because it's time for Lucky Time Explosion. Wow. I'm a Welcome. Uh, my name is Morgan Lappin. I am the founder of Brooklyn Collage Collective. I am a collage artist. And um, me and Brandon here made this show, Lucky Time Explosion. That's right. And uh, we talk about artists and their backgrounds and all the things that they don't usually talk about. The New York scene. Yeah, yeah, my name is Brandon Weiscarver. I am a virtual reality painter and programming director here at Solo Studio, where we're filming this today. So yeah, I'd like to welcome our guest today, TK Mills of the publication Up Magazine. We've got issue number, was this five? That's five, yeah. Ooh, number five in the house. So TK, uh, as far as I understand, is an art world luminary. <laughs> a, uh, a somebody doing something pretty brave these days, mm -hmm. which is making a print art magazine. Yeah. Yep. So yep, yep. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about um, print being dead. Mm -hmm. uh, I, for one, love to have my hands on it and actually touch a magazine. What What made you get into this in this era? Uh. Well, I feel like to kind of get into it, I got to give a, a little bit of backstory. Please do. Um, so, all right, I'll give the I'll give the TK Mills spiel. Um, <laughs> That's what we're here for. Yeah. All right. So, so yeah. So, uh, unlike many people in the contemporary art scene, I was not really an art kid. Um, it's funny, you know, ninety percent of my interviews, I start off with like, "Well, when did you start exploring exploring your creativity?" And everyone's like, "When I was a child." I was not that child. I was not creative. Um, I read. I like to read a lot, but I wasn't. I didn't doodle. I didn't do anything like that. Um, I did my undergrad at uh, CU Boulder. I studied political science and international affairs. Uh, I wanted to go into politics, make the world a better place, because I was. That, that was where I was at uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever. Have you given uh, up? Uh, <laughs> You're just like, I can't <laughs> even take where we're at right now. Yeah. You know what? Let it just go to shit. Fuck it all. I, I'm moving on to something else. I mean, in a sense, yes and no. I would say I haven't given up on making the world a better place, but I've come to the belief that politics is not the way to do it. Mm. Um, which oh. kind of leads into the art stuff. But yeah. So, so yeah, so I, I studied politics. Um, after college, I spent a year teaching English abroad, um, you know, had a really great time traveling went came back uh moved into new york city like 2015 um and i went to grad school at nyu i studied transnational security originally was kind of on the career track to go work for the state department mm. uh 2016 election happens um uh, i have this sort of epiphany of like wow this is a bunch of bullshit and uh there's a lot of bad actors across the spectrum i became very disillusioned and I hit this point where I was like, fuck all this noise. And so, like, literally New Year's uh, 2017, like 2016 to 2017, I went to Cuba on just, like, a solo backpacking trip. Uh, yeah, just, like, bought a ticket. Went. I was there probably, like, mm, maybe six, seven weeks. Um, and the first couple weeks, I was just drinking, partying, didn't really know what to do with myself. And I was kind of like, the whole purpose of it was, like, a soul-searching journey. Like, what do I actually want to do with my life if I'm not going to do this thing? I just spent the past six, seven years, like, you know, studying for. And I was kind of like, you know, whenever I travel, I always like to read books set in or like connected to places I'm traveling to. And uh, one of my favorite authors is Hemingway. So I was reading a lot of Hemingway down in Cuba. And, you know, I was like kind of thinking about it. And I was like, you know, in a perfect world, uh, I would want to be a writer. Like my personal role models are sort of that like jazz era, lost generation writers like Hemingway, Fitzgerald. Um, and so, you know, I was like, you know, I'd, I'd be a writer. I was like, you know, fuck it. While I'm down here, I got nothing else going on. I'm going to write something. And if I can get it published, you know, I'll be a writer. And so I kind of stumbled across uh, this graffiti artist, uh, graffiti writer, um, who uh, I guess I could say his real name at this point, Fabian. At the time, I didn't know the kosher on, you know, real <laughs> names and not. Yeah, you got to watch out, huh? Yeah, but he was all over Havana, and I kept seeing his stuff. And, you know, when I lived in New York, I lived in Bushwick, not really for the community. I just lived there because at the time it was cheap. Um, but, you know, I, I liked street and art. when was this? When was this? I moved into Bushwick, like, 2015. 2015. And I, I lived there for most of my New York life. Like, I would say of the past, like, eight nine years i've probably spent like seven of them in or around bushwick what was your train uh i was off the j train i lived out um the i j. was in between halsey and chauncey on the j mm -hmm. i was kind of like the far end yeah yeah uh, yeah 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 
I can go into a lot of stories about that. On the Myrtle Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Broadway. So you're, you're really, Which yeah. I call the Bermuda Triangle of Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You get it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we were talking about before I get distracted. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was in Cuba. I like street art. And so I was like, you know, I, I'm going to write some stuff. And uh, I'll write about this guy. It's pretty cool. So, you know, I kind of put together a little story about how I was like searching for this guy, you know, trying to find him, track him down. Um, and I ended up, by coincidence, more than real journalistic skill, I found the guy and I interviewed him. Really nice guy. He was like super friendly. Did a little story on him. I ended up getting published in this uh, London based street art magazine, Global mm-hmm. Street Art. Um, and uh, it went not viral, but it it did really well. It got really well re- uh, received on their like blog, whatever. And it was like a huge win. It was like, oh, cool. The first thing I wrote got published. Um, it was really encouraging. I wrote some other pieces on that trip. You know, some of them got published as well. There was like one was like a travel essay. One was like history. But the street art one was like the one that was like the first. And it was like, you know, it was a it, it was, was a, it was fuel for the fire. Yeah, it yeah. Was it, like, it was yeah, like the win I needed at that point in time. And so I, I came back to, you know, I lived in Bushwick after that trip. I was like, you know, why don't I, if I'm trying to kind of break my legs in this, let me try and just write about street art here. And so, you know, at the time I had a couple different day jobs. I was bartending. I was a waiter, you know, the various kind of New York odd jobs. And I started freelancing. Uh, I was freelancing for a bunch of different magazines, um, you know, Art Fuse, uh, a couple others. Um, oh, I know Art Fuse. Yeah, yeah, Jamie. Yeah. yeah, Jamie. Shout yeah. out. He, uh, he was one of the first people to give me a chance. I, I owe him a lot in that regard. You know, he's actually the first person I ever met in New York. No shit. Uh, about in the art world. Really? Like first art related person I've ever That's met. That's funny because like for me, I had a very similar kind of connect with him. He's out there, man. Yeah. So he's, yeah, so that, that snowballed into uh, Yeah, yeah. So. Up? Well, I was I was writing for a bunch of different publications, but you know the the impetus a lot of them were giving me it was like pushing me towards sort of the gallery scene, but I was more interested in the street art aspect. And you know, a lot of the editors were kind of like, "Hey, there's no future in street art. You shouldn't bother." And I was like, "Well, that's what I think is cool." Um, really? Yeah. Right. Well, what? And then there's a whole tangent I can go on about. You know, uh, Sold Mag, which was the first New York street art magazine. Oh yeah. Yeah, but that's I'll. I'll Come back yeah, to that later. We'll come back to that. Yeah. I, I have stories about Soul Mag as well. That's really funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I mean, again, shout out to them in, in a way. They were one of the people that gave me a shot. Shout out to JPO. Um, but anyway, they just fast forwarding to, you know, get through the spiel. So, you know, I'm freelancing for like two years. Late 2018, I had done a story that got shot down by an editor. And I was kind of like bitching and moaning about it to uh, a mentor of mine. And they were like, well, why don't you start your own magazine? And I was like, well, that sounds like a lot of work. I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> And I was right. It has been a lot of fucking work. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of where the idea started. Wow. And so that was like probably September 2018. And then by October, I had kind of come around to the idea. I started recruiting people. I recruited the only other art writer I knew at the time, Victoria Benzine. And then she brought in her friend, Christina Leah. And then we found uh, Lonnie Richards. And the four of us was the original squad for Up Magazine. That's amazing. The first issue was literally just the four of us, uh, wow. plus Tiago, our designer. But that's, when did that come out again? Because That was... Uh, 2019? Well, so it's funny. Uh, yeah, a couple 2019. Years. So we the first issue comes out June 2019. We had been working on it since like maybe November, December 2018. But... So we we were working on it for months. We probably finished it like March 2019. And I turned to our business advisor, who was supposed to be sort of the money guy, like, hey, we finished it, you know, let's get this bad boy published. And he was like, we are not going to pay for that. Or rather, he wasn't going to pay for it. And I was like, fuck. So then I went to some of the contacts I had, went to a bunch of investor meetings, put on my best suit, uh, you know, took it around to a couple people. Everyone said the same thing. They were like, we love it. We love the design. We love the idea. We love the concept. But you guys are untested, unproven. We're not putting money behind it. Mm. So I was kind of backed into a wall. And the only chance I had was, the only capital I, I had access to was uh, when I was born. You know, my parents took out life insurance for me over my, like, 25 years of life at that point. So it you had, faked your own death Well, for the seed money. No, I'm e- just kidding. Even better. <laughs> uh, I, I cashed it in. Nice. And so, yeah, it was worth, I think, like, $12,000 after taxes took a good chunk out of it. Uh, but I put all that money into the magazine. You know what's amazing? That's you amazing. literally bet your life on this. Yeah, well, yeah. that's the thing. I can, t- I can <laughs> literally, literally tell people. You literally bet your fucking I life can... on this magazine. Yeah. That's ballsy, my man. Yeah. Well, that's, that's for real. That's the magic of it. And I, I really do think that that's like a 
a core part of up is that I'm like, no, I, I put my life on the line for this bad boy, you know? Quite literally. Uh, yeah, that's a lot awesome. of people could say that. That's for damn sure. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so, yeah, June 2019, we have the... Uh, the release party, it's uh, it's an unexpected success. We sell Where out. Where are you having it? Where are you having it? Oh, no, no, no. The, this was like the original. Oh, yeah, the can first. we go back in time? Yeah, the, we're still uh, June 2019, you know? Nice. And uh, it was June 20th, 2019. And, um, but yeah, so end up selling out every copy of the magazine we had printed, all 250. It was a huge hit with the community. A lot of people came out to support. And I was like, okay, cool. This is something. We can we can do something with this. And then, yeah, over the past couple of years, it's grown in a lot of ways. Actually, next June 2024 is going to be the five-year anniversary. We're cooking up a couple of ideas for that. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's kind of up in a brief little nutshell. That's amazing, man. Yeah, that, yeah I, I met you when you were um, putting together issue two, yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. And we uh, helped. Uh, I was working at a spot that helped host the, the party for issue number yeah. two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is, um, I think the magazine is really important because I have not seen, uh, first of all, I want to say I'm shocked that, like, so many people told you they didn't see a future in street art. Yeah, right. Because now it's like everywhere. Like even the big galleries are picking up street artists. And I don't want to be like. it was back then too. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, you'd be surprised, man. A lot of was people, I think in the art world, I think uh, can't see beyond their own nose sometimes. And like, well, yeah. this is what I like and this is what it is, you know? Yeah. I and, mean, in some in some ways, that's kind of the nature of it though, right? Like yeah, a curator yeah. knows what they like and, you know, curates what they like. And no, 100%. It, yeah. it, it also, uh, art also often boils down to public interest, but it does it does surprise me to hear that you're getting that feedback at that, that time that art that street art has nowhere to go and it's getting into all these galleries you know yeah. I, back in the day uh I, I don't remember exactly which year probably like 2012 uh there was a fair called the um fountain art fair do you remember it no fountain art fair fountain, fountain art fair no it was the only art fair dedicated to street artists. Really? Mm -hmm. And it was run by a guy named David Kesting and uh, John Leo. And uh, John is now in New Orleans, but they it, it was one of the greatest art fairs that existed. And I used to show there, I, I used to make a lot of sales. A lot of amazing artists I met there, a guy named Dave Tree, who's a punk rocker from uh, Boston, and, and he did a lot of silk screen prints, but it was a huge fair, it was just like any other. They did it over at the Armory in 60, like mm. the old Armory, oh, I forgot. Nice. Yeah. And the performance art, they would, they would have people scaling the walls and the rafters and swing, I mean, it was quite the uh, art fair, and that was the only art fair dedicated to uh, street art, and they kind of had, I don't know the, the total story, there was a little bit of a fallout, and they went their own ways, and that was it. Yeah. But you should yeah. look back and research the Fountain Art Fair. They used to use the frying pan. Oh, oh I, I remember that the frying pan, yeah. To do yeah. their, and, but this is going back to maybe like 2000. Ten, I, I could be a little yeah. bit off, but like 2010, they were using the frying pan for art shows for their their fair, and oh, it was wild. such an amazing experience. Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. That's funny. Like, uh, so 2015. I mean, it's like it, I'm older now, so I'm always like, "What? That was yesterday." Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's hard to forget. It's hard to remember that was almost a decade ago, right? I know that's it's and it's wild. been so long for yeah. it. But um, the street art thing, I always find really interesting because, like, you know, as an artist, I'm constantly thinking about the movements that are afoot, what's happening and what's up with street art. Um, and uh, well, like, what are your thoughts on what's going on in the, in the space right now? And do you see, do you still see that like the, the thing that made you, you know, want to focus on it? Has that all changed at all with, uh, you know? I think what uh, made me want to focus on it hasn't changed. I still feel pretty dedicated to kind of our mission, uh, but to the, be sort of the broader street art world, I think a lot has changed, uh, you know, for better or worse. Um, I think there are certain aspects of it, you know, at least in the New York community, it's interesting. I think that, because uh, yeah, when I was coming in, it was funny, there was this whole sort of uh, rift between the graffiti community and the street art community, and, you know, graffiti writers feeling like street artists mm. were kind of taking their walls and stuff, and that rift still exists to some extent, but now it's interesting in the community, you see a lot of the, the new artists kind of getting in with the community, they don't even do walls, a lot of them are more sort of canvas artists, which there's nothing wrong with that, I mean, I think it's cool, but it's just interesting where it's like, I feel like a lot of people are back into wanting to go toward the galleries as right. opposed to wanting to... You know, well, they want the pay. money. Well, that's the whole thing. <laughs> is well, the I, thing. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I feel, but, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. So I live in Bushwick, like we were talking about before. I, I live off the Broadway Myrtle, mm -hmm. JM. 
And uh, within the time I've been living there, it's just so. I mean, every every building is just full of graffiti. Yeah, yeah. I was like, gonna ask, but you'll covered. notice even over there uh, how many of those walls are still writing because artists don't want to mix it up, and curators too. And this isn't disrespecting anyone. Yeah. Like JMZ walls is fucking great. Like all the good curators. But that's the other thing is a lot of walls have been painted, and especially it comes down to the property owners too, where if like they like a wall, they're like, well, I don't want to repaint it, and so yeah. there's a certain scarcity I think that comes with. Uh, with yeah. that, you know. I, I was gonna say, rewinding just a little tiny bit, as a, a listener hearing, mm. talking about the rift between graffiti writers and street artists, as an expert, please tell us what the freak the difference is between those. Yeah. So, what is the difference? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, that's actually, there's, uh, I think, a lot of, you know, cultural differences, but also sort of like aesthetic differences. Um, so, I guess kind of I'll rewind a little bit. So graffiti uh, in the contemporary sense started in basically the late 60s, early 70s out of, depending on whose version of the story you want to believe, either out of Philly or New York, but it really popularized in New York in the South Bronx. Uh, and what a lot the of- The whole wild style crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and what a lot of people don't realize is it was, uh, it was kids, like literally like teenagers, like 13, 14, 15 year olds. And it just started with kids just writing their names on shit. And then it kind of grew from people being like, well, to make my name stand out, I'm going to add a little bit more flair. I'm going to add some mm. cool style to it. Right. And then from people being like, well, I want more people to see my name, so I'm going to do it on the train. And then, you know, the inside of the train's got, like, all covered up. And so people are like, well, I'm going to paint the outside of the train so everyone can see it. And that's that's really how the movement grew. Yeah. Um, people were running out of space. They had to yeah. find new new places to hit up. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they had to contend with uh, Koch and yeah. his dogs. Mm. Well, and then it's the other thing, too. It's, it's funny. Um, the uh, the eighties saw the New York City officially declare war on graffiti because right. for a lot of people they were sort of the broken windows theory of policing, right. which essentially espouses that you know if you let small crimes go unchecked, it leads to bigger crimes. So there's a big pushback on graffiti because it was like, well, if we let graffiti happen, there's going to be murder, which is a bit of a logical jump. <laughs> but that was yeah. the thinking at the time. Um, but anyway. <clears throat> So the difference between graffiti and street art is graffiti is much more narrowly focused. It's uh, it's really about lettering, you know, and like literally, I mean, graffiti writers call themselves writers, not artists, uh, because they're literally writing their name in super beautiful, stylized, artistic ways, but they're writing. Versus artists, it kind of, with street artists, it kind of is a little bit more of a catch-all umbrella term that kind of applies to like a bunch of different forms and mediums where you have like wheat pasting, you could be a street artist, you know. Um, the way I'd put it is like, uh, all graffiti is maybe a form of street art, but not all street art is a form of graffiti. Um, yeah. and then there's also cultural differences where graffiti tends to be a little bit more like, uh, you know, people coming from marginalized communities, people on the come up in that regard versus street art tends to be a little bit more art school, a little bit more middle class. Um, and then there's a lot of different aspects of that, um, but this is a lot of what we've been exploring. So the next print issue we're actually putting out is uh, is graffiti themed. So with Up's content, you know, in the past, a lot of it's been sort of, you know, we, we try and do a balance between street art and graffiti, but for various reasons, it tends to be a little bit more street art. Um, so we're dedicating a whole issue just to graffiti and sort of the graffiti culture and the different elements of that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, another part of it that people don't realize is that back in the day when hip hop started, you know, there were the the elements of hip hop, which were basically emceeing, uh, DJing, breakdancing and graffiti. And right. those were the, the core elements. And then obviously hip hop has gone off to become its own, you know, world changing phenomenon where people hear hip hop and they just think of the musical aspects. Yeah. Um, but they don't really think of the visual aspect yeah. as much. Is but. the up and up mag for the throw up or the come up? Ah, a little bit of everything. Well, that's actually one of my favorite things to do with up is it has the endless uh, potential for puns. <laughs> yes. um, well, it's funny. Actually, I could talk about how the name came about. Puns uh, are nature's sweetest candy. Hey. Yeah. Yes. They are. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Tell me about the name. Where did you get the name up mag? So my original business advisor, when we were talking about the idea of a magazine, he was like, uh, what would you call it? And I'm like, I don't know. And he was like, uh, well, what's important in the community? I was like, well, you know, when you're going to paint, you're getting up. That's what they call it, you know? And he's like, well, what about get up? And I'm like, nah, it's too long. I was like, well, what about just, and I said back to him, I'm like, what about just up, up magazine? And then that was kind of where it came from. Um, and it's, you know, worked in a lot of ways with, yeah, it's like the get up, come up, you know, doing a piece, you're throwing up. Like it's yeah. a lot of different ways it works. 
But uh, a quick little tangent, I actually got an email the other week from uh, the other Up magazine. So we're not the uh, only Up there's magazine. There's another Up. There's uh, actually a few Up oh magazines. Boy. <laughs> there's an Up magazine that's a student publication in Miami that focuses on fashion. And then there's the other Up magazine uh, is based out of uh, north of Detroit. Uh, this guy, Mike. Uh, and he, oh, you know him now. Yeah, well, it was Oh, fun. he knows you. He sent me an email <laughs> and, you know, he was kind of like, A, you know, like we have the same name, but like he was like obviously a little defensive toward it at first. And I was kind of like, let's just let's just hop on a call and like, you know, chat about it. And we ended up getting on really well. And so I'll give him a shout out. I ordered a subscription to his up magazine. Oh, He's also nice. a print so magazine. Sweet. He's been doing it for like 30 some years. Yeah. Uh, really cool guy. But yeah. His up focuses a little bit on regional stuff of kind of the like Great Lakes region uh, and a lot of other stuff as well, but kind of like, you know, uh, versus we're just like mostly street and graffiti focused. We do some contemporary art, like we do some music, we do some, you know, some gallery stuff, a bit of this and that, but like street yeah. art and graffiti I, is our like it's, it's core. Like yours, yours, it's kind of like the culture, you know? It's yeah. like, it's like yeah. the culture. The so we met in, a, in an interesting uh, way. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I was a subject of an interview. Yeah. For yeah, yeah. number two. Well, for... So was that three? Could, yeah, could I give the sort of the R side of the context? Yeah, actually, totally. That's a good idea. I think you should uh, explain it, uh, how you interacted with me, and then I'll explain from my side what was going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did our opening June 2019 uh, at the Storefront Project, which was cool, but it was kind of small, and we had a huge fucking crowd, and the owners were a little upset we brought so many people. So I was like, all right, oh, wow. second issue, we got to find a bigger space. At this time, I had been hearing a lot about con artists, and I heard they had a new space. I'm like, oh, cool, let me go by there. Maybe we can work with them, work some out. And so I, I came to Con Artists, and my point of contact was you, uh, who I basically worked with, had a great time, great relationship. We ended up having our second issue release party there. You know, it had some hiccups, but overall, it was a hit. It was, and it worked really well. We had a yeah. great thing. Part of the deal we had with uh, you guys letting us have the space was that we were going to do a story for the next issue on uh, on con artists so i was like oh cool right issue three we're gonna do a story on con artists you know talk to brandon talk to whatever and then like a week after we had like the release party i uh went to follow up with con artists be like oh so you know brandon where you at for the interview and you're like well i've i've been fired and i was like what <laughs> yeah. and then it was like this whole thing where i was like wait what the fuck and then um yeah as i kind of wrote the story i kind of learned more of the details talking to in the middle of writing it yeah yeah i was in the middle of writing it as it was unfolding yeah. with uh, all three of you guys of your br names oh uh, god i know we all had br names brian yeah. Brand, brandon and, and bradley yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about why that, because uh, I was fired, right? That doesn't yeah. look good. i got to defend myself a little here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Con Artist Collective, actually, I'm sure people listening, anybody listening to this probably knows Con Artist, knows me. Uh, knows the legacy, yeah. Kind of heard about this story a little bit. But I guess, I mean, good. To, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so, Con Artist was founded in 2010. Uh, by a man named Brian Shevlin, who similar to yourself was not really, didn't ever consider himself like a creative, mm -hmm. but he was very much interested in that. And he, he created this um, co-working space and artist run studio gallery space called Con Artist in the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. uh, and it slowly, like I was actually the first employee ever at Con Artist. I was the first like paid employee to ever exist at Con Artist. I showed up there, um, you know, to be like an intern, and I ended mm -hmm. up being the janitor, and then I ended up being the general manager, uh, and then Brian uh, reached to a point like right before to 2020. It wait, was like, wait, wait, roll yeah. up from yeah. janitor to general manager. Janitor to general manager. You, you, made the class. Class. you know how you do this? You read about in issue three. Yeah, you just, you just show up and you work hard, and then you say, "I'll do the job," and they'll say, "Okay." Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, the way I got Brian to give me the position was pretty funny. He was interviewing <clears throat> general managers. He was mm -hmm. looking to hire a GM. And I had been an intern, but I had like forced him to allow me to help with like construction. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. he was like, I don't want to do that. That's not ethical. 
you know, to have like an intern, an unpaid intern, like working manual labor. And I'm yeah. like, no, 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 that's fine. It's fine. It's like, I, I love, I love screwdrivers. Let me do it. Yeah. So I basically forced him to let me do a general, like manual labor. Uh, and then he saw the hustle and he's like, oh, uh, that's great. Um, and then he was hiring uh, as a man, as he hired me to be a janitor and like clean up after all the artists in the space. Um, then he told me he was looking for a GM and I told him, you know, well, I've been a GM at like a, a movie theater, you know, in California. Uh, I'm here all the time. I know everything. Just hire me and you won't have to get up early and, or wor worry about it. And he did. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did that for about five, six years actually. And it was, yeah. I met you like, right near the tail end of it because Brian had sold the business. So he was at a point with the landlord, classic New York story. Yep. The rent got too expensive. The landlord was changing hands, <laughs> yeah, yeah, giving it to her children who were going to, of course, just sell it to a corporate real estate company. Yeah. So we had to like kind of bolt out of there. And Brian was telling me like, I want to keep you in the family. I want to, you know, let's figure out how to do it. He'd actually opened another gallery mm -hmm. called Lazy Susan Gallery nearby. Yeah. And he was like, maybe I can have you do some like commission work at, at Lazy Susan. And I'm like, I don't want to go from salary to commission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sucks. Yeah. You know, so I basically said, why don't you sell con artist as a business? Mm -hmm. And he was like, actually, I always found this funny. I feel like you're one of those people who can <laughs> see value in some of these like smaller stuff that's mm -hmm. coming up. Uh, and know it's worthy of covering and know it's worthy of getting out there because he he totally was like let's start it um he started another gallery and he's like let's have you at lazy susan and i'm like i don't want to go there i don't want to go backwards mm -hmm. um you don't know what you have here is what yeah. i was saying he was like thinking no one's gonna buy it i'm like you you created a good name in the art world in yeah. manhattan for a decade yeah i'm like that is super impressive and everybody thinks you're a legend for that already i'm sure somebody would see that in monetary terms mm -hmm. but the timing was so tight um and everything was happening so quickly that when it came time to like we need to get out or we mm -hmm. need to move or reduce the collective in some way uh one of our other um clients actually bradley uh was uh just basically asked you know he actually hired me away to do UX design on mm -hmm. an app that never came to fruition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I told him I didn't know how to do UX design. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, "That's fine, you'll learn." Yeah, I said, yeah. "Fuck, I'm that's happy. I'm happy to learn and uh, you know get paid to learn at the same time." There you go. Yeah. But that app didn't didn't pan out, and uh, Bradley came in and tried to like uh, you know say we we did. I mean, for the first year and a half after he came in, it was actually good. We did the we did the All Star Show on Allen Street. You guys had the big. Uh, 4th of July launch. I remember that was yeah. when I found the space. The 4th of July launch was pretty crazy at the new space. We took over the place that used to belong to um, White Box Gallery. Do you mm. ever go to White Box? It was a huge gallery. It's one of the biggest gallery spaces in downtown Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, and so at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of detail to this and drama and all these yeah. funny details. I don't know if I want to get into entirely, but at the end of the day, it wasn't a good fit. We bit off too much more than we could chew. Uh, and basically after moving into the bigger space, you know, things started to kind of fall apart because I couldn't get what I felt we needed to mm -hmm. run the company, you know, well, and to be honest, I think he was sick of people deferring to me, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, it's yeah. like, he's, he's poning up the money. I understand that. Honestly, actually, I'm like, I get it. Like, I'm not saying it was a good thing. I think it was tragic what happened, but I kind of get it when you're like getting kind of pissy that, you know, yeah, so, well, I, I someone's get... the face of the company that you're bankrolling, but yeah, we fought. We yeah. got into, we were fighting back and forth on this stuff. And it is, the timing was fucking crazy for the, for the article. Cause like yeah. <laughs> you wrote, you wrote half of this article, uh, with just like gushing reviews about how great everything is, Yeah, you yeah. know, for the last 10 years. <laughs> and then we have a new owner a new space and the article's not as halfway written while well, everything's changing so radically. But yeah. yeah. Cause it kind of came down to where I was like the, you know, I interviewed probably like 12 people for that story, but like the yeah. three principal ones was, yeah, you, the you and the two owners right and it was like literally the transition phase and i remember bradley was kind of upset with me because he wanted it to only be about you know got rebranded to bauer union and only be right. well i'm like you, you can't talk about that without talking about the 10 years of history and right. the pro you know the people who are part of this right that's kind of the things we fought about too because it was like yeah. you know he wanted to rename it and um, i was like that's literally all you bought i'm like you bought the name bro yeah. like the that's name is the, the legacy yeah the name is the legacy you know, I get it because people he, used to tease <clears throat> Brian about it. What did he want to change it to? Well, uh, uh, the Bowery Union. Yeah, that's no, what it no, got no, called. No, Bowery no, Union. No, no. Actually, I mean, I'll, I'll take my time. I'll, I'll do a little bit. I can always edit if I want. Um, yeah, <laughs> but. I actually came up with that name. Ah. So Bradley, before he got rid of me, he goes, uh, Brian, we need a new name. We need to rebrand. Uh, Con Artist is holding us back because, and, and, and to be fair to him too, and a lot of the stuff people said, 
it, it did have that effect. Brian named it Con Artist Collective because of the tongue in cheek joke yeah, about the yeah. art world being full of con artists. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to say that before Bradley even was in the picture, that was a discussion where like people were like, you maybe want to consider changing your name. Yeah, because it has a connotation. It has a bad connotation. Yeah. And like that was what made it cool, but yeah. conversely made a lot of people actually walk in the place like clutching their purse. Yeah, like a little they'd bit. Walk, <laughs> they'd walk in and be like, you're not going to steal my shit, are you? And yeah, like, yeah. I don't think we'd name it that. Yeah, it's because most serious. people are stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is also but true. It, it was a small community space, you know, and it was one of the, it's a really special place. And um, it, it was a special place because it was a place that allowed artists a lot of freedom yeah. uh, to do whatever they want and uh, really was run by artists and not in this commercial world. We tend to separate that. I think the big criticism of New York right now is that there's not a lot of a scene. Yeah, I, and you're I covering it though. You're 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 showing where it is. Like you're actually yeah. you're actually covering it and making it visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think because I really think that the biggest reason we get that criticism about there not being a scene is because no one cares to cover it. Yeah, well, I think it's bullshit. Uh, and you know, we can kind of go into this in in depth if, or however much depth because it's like you know the the street art scene in New York is like maybe 300, 400 people, and yeah. you know we all know each other. We all hang out at the same shows, whatever. And yeah. You know, that's for better or worse, it's a community. Uh, and, you know, like any community, it's got its dramas, it's got its petty bullshit, it's got, oh, yeah. you know, its heroes and its villains. And, you know, we, we do point of, like, covering that. Um, that would be a great theme for, for a magazine, Heroes vs. Villains. Yeah, right. that could I be like an interesting, this. you know. Yeah. Well, and it's funny, too, because uh, sometimes the villains are my favorite. Yeah, you know? there you go. Just like but, WWF. Yeah, you know? right. We'll, we'll, same, we'll have, same like, a heel. You know, someone that's, like, to come in to <laughs> fuck it up. But, yeah. Um, but no, uh, but yeah, like I, I think, yeah, like with the community, because like part of it too is some people get frustrated because the community can be a little too insular, not in the sense that people aren't welcome. If anything, it's very welcoming, but in the fact that it's hard for people to grow beyond it and actually, you know, become a full-time artist. Right. Um, because it's like, you know, you're in these shows, but you know, who really sells at shows and yada, yada, yada. And again, the, there are people who have grown beyond it and, you know, there's sales that happen. I mean, I've of had course, a few yeah. sales, but... That is, I think, a criticism people have, but I, I also think yeah, it's like, but like those, I, I don't know that criticism. I'm, I'm quick to slap down because, like, if you're not out there and trying to get your stuff seen, like, how yeah. are you ever gonna get seen? You're just never gonna happen. And no, totally. It, I think that people lose sight of the fact of how long of a game the art is. Well, I think that's that, and especially I've talked to a couple of friends of mine who are younger artists where they're kind of like. You know, they're looking for the quick butt. They're like, I'm going to be famous in five years or less. It's like, that doesn't happen. You, you could, know? but like... I mean, the best way for that to happen is to die tragically. You know yeah, what I yeah, mean? that's true. Like, but like, you know, if you really want a career, you got to you gotta put in the time, you got to put in the work. But do. I, I do think there is a big divide that I see between the people who are in it for the party and the people who are in it for the career. And yeah. I think... Interesting. Uh, what about you know, the people who are in it for the art? Are they out there at all? Yeah, sure. I mean... <laughs> Well, you know, I would say those are the people that are for the career. Because, like, to me, yeah. it's like I, you know, I see a lot of work that I love. There's also work I see that I don't love. But, you know, those people sometimes are successful. I mean. Well, sometimes I say that, um, I like to say that art is not a career. It's a compulsion. And yeah. it's something that, you know, if you get lucky with or you're particularly shrewd or, or smart about marketing. Yeah. Then yeah. you can potentially, you know, make a living off of it. Shit. But at the end of the day, <laughs> <laughs> you're like this I whole just time. Get by, no, I, I, I do it. I, I, yeah. I, within the last two years, I would consider myself a full-time artist. There you yeah, go. That's totally. good. But I mean, if you could do <clears throat> it full-time, I consider that successful now, there's in a and of spectrum, itself. There's 100%. a spectrum of how successful you are. And uh, I guess from one to ten, yeah, I'm like a little. I'm I'm somewhere behind five. Yeah, no. <laughs> but, 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 you're but not, I'm though. just getting by. You, I mean, you started the but Brooklyn. getting by is something on yeah. your art like that. That in itself, you should you know give yourself the, well, the pat I, the back. I don't I don't want this to be in the episode because it sounds like it's too bad. Shit. Now I'm gonna put it in no matter what. <laughs> yeah, right. Shit. No, I just had a show with uh, in um, Red Hook with Gibby Haynes, the lead singer of Butthole Surfers. Oh, nice. And, um, Kip Malone, the lead singer of TV on the radio, and Gibby Haynes, it didn't matter how big his piece was, whether it was huge or small, they were all 5,000 apiece. Yeah, yeah. So there was that. Yeah. Uh, Kip's was a little bit more affordable, and then I was like super high range, I had pieces like selling for like 12,000 to mm. like 200, and I sold four pieces and no one else sold anything. Yeah. And I was like, wow. 
That's I don't well, you're know. saying you're really... shocked that the celebrity factor didn't kick in for the art sale. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wait, you know why? Because I, yes. I really believe there, there's a reason for that, though. And I, I think that it's really antith- and antithetical and hard to get your brain around. But here's but like, the thing. I'll tell you this. Yeah. All the people. So we had it, it was up for a month and uh, we had an opening. We had a soiree and we had a closing. So yeah. we had three events out of yeah. the, the month. And um, I would say maybe somewhere around like 50 Five percent. Let's be nice. Fifty percent of the people who came to each one of those events were probably a part of someone who I knew. Yeah, right? they came for me, and I was just like, and everyone's yelling at me. They're like, they didn't fucking, they didn't fucking promote it. They didn't fucking promote it. They didn't, you know, whatever. And I'm like, well, buttholes. Instagram promoted it. Blah 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 blah. And then moving forward to this show that I just had at um, all day. Yeah, mm-hmm. I had three people that all had like. 50,000 plus followers, yeah. right? And usually I do like 15 plus artists. Yeah, yeah, That's a sure win. Yeah. So I had these artists come and um, not too many. I, I was like super disappointed. Yeah, Like yeah, yeah. heartbroken. Was, was that like, the one the that fuck? I had bought by? No, uh, uh, the one that I just recently had. Mm-hmm. And I realized that if you're going to do those kind of shows as a curator, you kind of have to do a show where you have 15 local artists. Yeah. Maybe. But like, here's the thing. And I think that you maybe understand this uh, more than artists can. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, it's a very much a retrospective sort of thing, right? We look back at what's happened in art and we decide that something's important or not. Yeah. And I think we get lost a lot of the times in trying to promote something properly or, like, come up or do this thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really, like, the, the history and work like this, like making these magazines that's talking about shows that are coming up that aren't getting national press mm-hmm. uh, in a place like New York where you have so much amazing talent. Like, this is where you're going to see good talent first. No, totally. You know, because uh, people, like, they want to have it, um, like, people either care about one or other thing one or two things in art they either care that the artist is like famous and it's a it's an artifact from some celebrity that's famous for something else or yeah. for some other art uh or and they get a piece that they kind of like based on the fame of the other art yeah, yeah, yeah or it's um you know really more genuine than that it's like it's about the artwork itself and that one piece connects with you that one thing and like you have that conversation uh with the work as a buyer as a, as a lover of it um, you know, I have several, I have a collection of art and like maybe half of it is just cause people I know who I liked their work, but most of it is like, I, I wanted this thing and I didn't care who it was or how yeah. much it was. It's like, I really wanted that thing. Um, Not totally. but okay. yeah, it, it, it's an interesting scene. Like the scene here is, is definitely funny cause there's a lot of people who want to just smooth mm-hmm. and, and network and talk and get famous for like, for what though? Like, what's the point? What, what are you going to get famous for? What are you giving? What are you contributing to the medium? What are you contributing to, you know, the, the whole scene as well, a whole? Well, I, I also just think that's social media as a whole. A lot of people, it's, uh, y- you know, it's just like the fame for fame's sake kind of thing. Right. Uh, which I'm not really about. You know, other people are. Again, I, I try and adopt a policy of, like, teach their own. I'm not going to shit on anyone you're, for whatever you're, uh, they want art to. for art's sake. Yeah, but you know what I mean? It's like if I had... No one reading this magazine, I would make it because I've been there. Now that we've got 100,000 people a month reading our website, I'm still there. You know what yeah. I mean? It doesn't make a difference. No, I'm actually really proud. We, we've like, That's the past huge. year and a half, we've hit that stride where like, now we really have an audience. And like having that audience doesn't always translate, right? Like, right. you know, we're still building our Instagram. We're still building our subscriptions. We're still building this. But like people check out our website. Part of that is... Um, we we you know we've got uh we're consistent we publish every week we've never missed a week wow even during the covid yeah so this is this is physical publications or this is this is online okay i was gonna say holy shit honestly uh god jesus uh, i I mean if you have unlimited funds that would be a difference well that's and like honestly that's what the biggest limitation on doing the print issues is is the funding versus you know (laughs) uh the website's a little bit more accessible and do you do you have a situation where advertisers do take up print space or oh yeah yeah you can even flip through that we got we got ads and a lot of it's other small businesses you know we've kind of built that out where like we've got um different sponsors that we work with sometimes we got repeat sponsors sometimes we get some new people we've had some big names uh issue four i think was the one that was sponsored by the getty publication 
um, you know, massive yeah. international, you know, and they, the reason they had sponsors, they had put out a graffiti book um, that year. And, you know, like for our next issue, the graffiti issue, we've got one, we got Montana, which is like probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest spray paint company yeah. in the world that a lot of artists love. Awesome. Um, so, you know, we're getting to that point where we're starting to get in contact with like real advertisers, but also give a shout out to like Beer Canvas, another small business lives down the block from us. Mike's a homie. He does great work. If you like to drink beer and you like to drink it, have a cool glass, pick up some uh, beer canvas stuff. Um, nice. You but, got like you hooking up artists with that opportunity? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. But and it's funny too, though, because like the next issue is the graffiti issue. And um, I actually reached out to this one sponsor and he literally sent me this nasty email of like, graffiti is a blight on society. What? And like, yeah, <laughs> like nice. went on this whole thing. And I was like, how old was this person? Uh, this man was probably in his 60s. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he was, he was also living in Seattle and whatever. But, but I think back to that street art versus graffiti, part of it's also what we call the work on the street beyond like the aesthetic or the culture differences it's also sort of that like yeah what you call it is going to affect people's perception you know right. what i mean um but yeah i mean and you know part of it too is again going back to graffiti culture it's like part of graffiti is a lot of it has to be illegal um in the eyes of many graffiti writers to be cool yeah Who, yeah yeah, 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 I yeah. Mean, it's well there's wizard skull made that thing i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you oh right. no 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 it's okay i was gonna just ask what are you, what are your some some of your favorite graffiti artists yeah. um of all time or like in our issue all i guess time. in combination of all time and currently oh that's a good question you know i wasn't quite ready for it um, I guess there's different people I like for different reasons. Uh, I'll give a shout out to One Up, who is in the next issue. I think what's cool is they are a crew and they are international. Nice. Uh, that very first trip to Cuba, I had seen One Up tags, uh, not knowing anything about it, but I just was gravitated toward it. Of and, course. And then now it's like years later, it's like, oh, that's fucking cool that like we we're able to like connect with them because they're they're also they they're like graffiti to the core, they like do illegal shit. They literally did a takeover. So they, they call their project actions and they did an action in the Mediterranean Sea where there's literally this downed cruise liner and they painted mm. a giant one up mural <laughs> along the side of it. It's nice. really cool. They've got like drone footage from like thousands of feet in the air. Um, it's really cool. Um, and then it's also like, you know, there there's the people that uh, do cool stuff in the streets today. I'll give a shout out to my friend Paolo, Paolo Tolentino. He has a really cool eye for um, like almost, I, I, guess, I guess I would describe his style like some of his like retro like travel ads in a way. Uh, if you can, I don't know if That's you guys cool. can like insert stuff on the green screen. Yeah, or whatever. we'll throw him up here. Yeah, yeah. He does really cool work. Paolo is a, is a homie. He's been doing it for years and he's, he's starting to get his flowers now from, you know, bigger companies and stuff. But like, I really like what he does. I, I like stuff. Um, cause like my taste kind of varies. Some of it is from the aesthetic where I'm just like, oh, that's cool. Some of it I could appreciate like, well, that was like impressive technically. And then some of it just like resonates, you know, as right. a writer, I like a lot of, um, text-based stuff. I like people that incorporate, yeah, like wordplay into what they do. Um, you're, you're coming at it from more angles than just the visual. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. There's different reasons for why I, I gravitate to something. I, yeah. you know, and like the, I'll give another guy, um, uh, this guy recycled propaganda. He is not a friend, so I'm not just shouting out friends. Uh, we actually reached out to him for a story, and he basically told us to get lost. Uh, <laughs> but I do love his work. His is a lot of politically motivated stuff. See, that's it. You know, yeah. he, he won't give him a shout out, and he's still shouting him out. That's yeah. great. He's like, yeah. he's like, get out of here, and he's like, you're still got good work. Yeah, that's no. how I know you're in it for the right reason. Yeah, he's, uh, uh, he just gets cool shit. And, you know? and, and speaking of that, like one thing I think we talked about a little bit, or we touched on a little bit earlier, that I kind of think is an interesting topic um, is art as political yeah. speech. And you coming from this background of political science mm -hmm. into art, I find that especially fascinating uh, because I have, you know, a few or like Brie, you've worked very closely with oh, Brie yeah. uh, at the Sour Marts. And she's of the she's one of those artists in the camp of like every all art is political. Yeah. 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 You kind of agree with that? You think like all art is, is political no. or that? No. <laughs> yeah. Like, no. And, and Brie and I have had discussions on it. And I, yeah. I love and adore and have the highest respect for Rubio. We do yeah. agree on that. I, well, especially some people, you know, particularly from academic circles, it's like, well, street art is inherently political because you're putting right. your voice out on the street, right. unauthorized. And, you know, I don't really buy that. Um, you know what I'll say about that is I think that um, in a fucked up way, and this is like, okay, I, I really want to avoid just like trashing and digging on street artists because yeah, like yeah. that's your bread and butter here. And we're talking about some really important cultural stuff. But I do find that like, I've, in my opinion, 
I think a lot of street artists sometimes feel like they have to be political, and well, so they start inserting politics into it. Do well, you? I think that's again the social media effect, right? You got to be topical, um, yeah. and a lot of people want to just hit something because it'll trend or it could go viral. Right. You know, like the Ukraine uh, or most recently Israel Gaza, and, and and not even getting into all that, but like people will hit on a topic because it's trending. Uh, right. And so our fourth issue, so again, you know, each issue of Up, uh, each print issue is thematic. Uh, the first issue was money. Uh, the second issue was travel and place. The third was community and culture. Uh, this most recent one, fifth issue is icons. Next was graffiti. But the fourth one was politics. And that was our 2020 issue. Mm. And so it was all about the election, yeah. all about the pandemic. And also that's one of the ones I'm most proud of because uh, it felt like the hardest in terms of like, the spiritual work of putting that one together. And I wrote probably one of the things I'm most proud of. I, I wrote my an essay on my own politics on it. Nice. Uh, and if you really want to hear some of my thoughts, you gotta you Ooh, gotta pick up that issue and read I will. it. I'm gonna dig into that. Yeah. But um but like one of the things is like, you know, there are a lot of artists that, you know, this is the twenty twenty election everyone a lot of art on the street that could basically be boiled down to Trump bad. Yeah. And I, I think Trump's yeah. a piece of shit. I'm not a fan at all. But from an art perspective, it's like, it's really boring. It's like, you're not adding anything. You're not saying anything new. Yeah. You're not like really building a conversation. It's just like Trump bad. And it would get hundreds of likes or whatever right. reposts because it's like, yeah, Trump is bad. And it's like, yeah, Trump is Ben. And like, what else? You yeah. know? I think if you're, if you center yourself around hating something, you just, you suck what generally would, no matter what it is. What would yeah, be I don't your, care what it you is. Were, if you were a street artist, yeah. what would be your tag? Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know what I would choose to be a street artist. Like, what I would do. I, I think about like, that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think what about would that all you, the time. To leave that everywhere you go, you no, got a, I, you got a paint marker. You're going everywhere. I got what an do you, answer what for you. Wise. What are you leaving? Wise, yeah. Wise? My last name, like Wise Carver. Yeah. Like Wise. Oh, cool. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I like that. But no, I do like street that's art, good. and I like. And the, the reason I don't do it is because I don't ever feel confident enough in my thesis to take yeah. it out and do a poster and like roll it up and be like, "This we is don't the need politics." We just need. No. You need a you need a paint marker and you just need, yeah. I how about know. how about you? Well, uh, I well I do I do some tagging from you time do. to so time. You do so you can't you can't don't say, say that. No, no, no. I rather won't. I, but. I, I I'll, I'll tell you I have one that I've been thinking about for a while. Mm -hmm. It's just snarf snarf, <laughs> just double snarf. Yeah, double snarf. There's Slutto. Slutto is yeah. Slutto. You know Slutto? Yeah, I I'm familiar. I always pronounce it Sluto, but it's probably a Sluto. I don't know. That's the thing. That's like the PC way to pronounce it, Sluto. Yeah. Yes. I mean, well, I'm, I'm I feel broken, like English language, so. you know, how you pronounce O's and vowels, whatever. But uh, no, I see his stuff a lot, or hair stuff. Who's to say, you know? Yeah. But I, but that's one of the things with uh, graph. Going back to it, is a lot of graph tags tend to be four or five letters. Yeah. Because you have to big. get it out quick. Right. And and you know. <laughs> If your name's you like Mr. Peanut Butter, it's going to take you too long to write. You're going to get caught by the cops. Mr. Peanut Butter is really <laughs> long. Yeah. There was this guy, I, I, you know where I live now, and uh, there was a guy named D. Brad. Uh, no, it was like... D. Brad? It was something like... It, it was the worst graffiti I've ever... And he was everywhere. It was called D. Brad or something like that. It was horrible. Why is it horrible? It was just so yeah, bad. I mean, I know there's an aesthetic for shitty graffiti. Well, yeah. But this was like below the aesthetic for well, shitty graffiti. I will also say say this, like talking about graffiti now, not street art. Yeah. With graffiti, uh, you know, and we actually in our next issue, Menace has a really good artist forward. We talked about this. Mm. Graffiti is a sport more than it's an art. Oh, and yeah. And there are different ways people play the sport. Got you know, it. some people, it's just about quantity over quality yes doesn't matter what it is it's just as much as you can everywhere yep all the time yep. getting it out it doesn't matter what it looks like doesn't even matter what it says it's just it's a game of domination how much you could put it over everyone else and like you basically yeah but force i thought that if you go over somebody else that's like a big like oh, yeah, no, if you get caught at least no it's a disrespectful thing it people is got their ass kicked for it but people still do it oh my you god, god I, mean? I mean that's the, the the name of the game anyways yeah. i mean there's only x amount of canvases and yeah well and again that happen. comes back to the whole thing of graffiti and you know the idea of it like being a sport is like right. some people don't like that especially street artists a lot of them are more respectful you know yeah. generally speaking and then they get done over by a graph yeah. writer and sticker culture too oh, stickers yeah. over stickers yeah, yeah. and I, I think it, street culture in general it's kind of the like live and let live which is one of the things that attracted me to it but it's also one of the things i find interesting about graffiti is there is that big ego aspect in graph culture oh i want to talk know? about that for a minute so my my background right is mm. um yeah, i'm a fifth grade dropout Mm -hmm. I'm really passionate about art. I went to junior college and I learned everything I possibly could from bronze foundry, color theory, art history, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, I came to New York. I found my success with con artist, uh, and that's where I met you uh, after you doing that second issue. But 
my i feel like a lot of the same reasons that people are attracted to street art and mm -hmm. are the same reasons that i kind of was and why i thought connor's was like the coolest place on earth because it was like artists directly yeah engaging with the public without these filters of like culture curators galleries all that stuff yeah. now the thing that i thought was funny was my preconceptions changed over time mm -hmm. originally i used to think of like the most pretentious like stuck up difficult people in the world would be like your uh, mfa yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you're like your conceptual art MFA nerd, and then being in that gallery world, it's kind of crossing the the lines that we're, we're straddling the lines of like gallery and street art stuff. I found the opposite to be true, mm -hmm. and I'll say it. I don't care. You know, I love you all. I love all of you guys. But oh my god, street artists and graph writers are like the most dramatic. Oh yeah, people I've ever met in my life, and I'm like. Please give me an NFA conceptual artist to, to yeah, be yeah. snarky at me. <laughs> Some of them get really, really defensive, upset, um, you know, weird and def and like clicky. No, I, and I think there are a lot of clicks in the art world. Well, I, I will shout out. So one of the things we've been doing is we have uh, our neighborhood art series, which is uh, at the Buren. It's a cafe in Bushwick. It's actually not too far from you. I mm -hmm. actually had a show there a while ago. No I shit. put I cut out like hundreds of different Waldos and I put them in really fucked up places. Oh, that's kind <laughs> of funny. I had a show there. But yeah, so so the whole uh, thesis of the neighborhood series that I kind of started because the owner, uh, George, is a friend. He just asked me to do a show and so it became like a monthly thing. But the whole idea is that when I curate the shows, there's sometimes we have themes, but the bigger thing is I try and pick two or three people from each of the different cliques and put them together. Mm. So people kind of meet people outside their immediate circle of Genius. like everyone doing the same. That's but I, awesome. But I, to your point, yeah, no, I mean, there's definitely a lot of drama queens and divas, especially with social media. Everyone's got to hop on their soapbox and, you know, say what they got to say and whatever. Yeah. And honestly, I ignore a lot of it. Um, you know, I make it a point that like, you know, with me in the magazine, it's like up exists beyond me. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I never want my ego to, you know, to shadow what up is. And, you well, know, it even, could be, yeah, the yeah, future. You know what I mean? And like, uh, it's like, a, like I kind of take pride in that too, where it's like, you know, there's some people, some events, some curators who really put themselves front and center. And like, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But for me, I, I, I kind of prefer to be the behind the scenes guy more often than not. Yeah. Um, it was funny, actually, in the beginning of up, we had a whole conversation, me, Lonnie, Vitt, and Stina about, you know, who's going to be the face of the magazine. Yeah. And I didn't want to do it. Uh, it kind of like I became it <laughs> just because I was the one in. stuck around the longest. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm the one that this, sold my life for it. You kind of have to at some point put yourself out there. You're the impetus up here. Yeah. You started it. Well, and, and I'll, I'll say that on the flip side, too. Uh, I don't like people that are too cool. You yeah. know what I mean? Back to that about promoting shows. I don't like people who are too cool. Like, you know, if you're in a show, repost on your story. There's nothing, like, you know, like, I hate that where it's like, yeah, you get busy or whatever about people who just, like, are too cool to, like, promote something because they don't want to seem lame or they're too mm. cool to, like, want to try something new. It's like, don't be an asshole. Like, you know what I mean? You know, honestly, my experience makes me think of one thing, which is, like, why would I not promote something as an artist and um, knowing artists yeah. so much? I wonder sometimes if it's because they're too cool Unless they particularly tell you, like, this is something that's beneath me and I don't really feel comfortable doing it. I wonder if it's or because they're too, too cool. Not even anxious. I think what it is is um, I think it's because they're looking for a new outreach and they literally just think, like, you know, I don't want my friends there. <laughs> like, that could be it. That could be, like, I, I sometimes I wonder if an artist is, like, testing me when they don't promote yeah. a show. You know, I'm like, are you just testing to see how many I, people I can bring here? And, like, you're cutting out your network? Oh, is that why? I I'm, want everyone to come. I want my grandma to come. She's same. too old, though. I promote my balls off. I ask the artists to promote it. my balls off. Well, I, they promote my balls, and I promote their balls. Yeah. We promote each other's balls. But part of it is all three of us, even though we're the spectrum of creativity, we all have played the role of organizer, and you understand how important that is. A lot of artists, for them, a show is you show up, you drop off your piece, you don't think about it, and then you show up, people are there, maybe they buy your art. They right. don't realize all the behind the scenes that goes into it. Absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. I do, and it. I don't know why I do it at the end of every show that I do. I'm like, why Yeah. Why do why I continue I to this? do this? Because I, I put myself, I jump through fucking flaming hoops. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and and that's exactly it. Crazy. But that's why you promote shit. But it, but it's, it's, because it's, you know. It's, it's, it's a passion of love that's yeah, yeah. what it is like i keep on doing it's it because be. like i mean at the end of each time i'm like i'm gonna blow my fucking brains out yeah, yeah, yeah but then i'm like 
okay, I got a new date set and I'm ready to go. Well, you got to do it. Like I said, it's a, it's a compulsion. It's something we have to do to yeah. try and, con, you know, contribute. I mean, uh, you know, curating is an art form. So as an artist who does analog collage, absolutely, obviously there's a little bit of correlation because it's it's the same thing. You're just a collage of people showing up. I mean, I guess you could use you can use that over and over and again. Mm -hmm. But um, I like putting together shows. It's yeah. like a collage of humans showing their work. I mean, I, that's I, how I look at it. At least, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I look at it like it's. Um, one of the things that we value in artists, right, is the ability to kind of like they, they just they produce a lot of work. They have their mm. vi we value the individual mm -hmm. heavily in art. We look at an artist and it's all about the individual. A lot of you know, there's that running meme that like it's not even the artist, the artist. Yeah. That we care more about the artist than the art. And I feel like it does a disservice to artists because they are so used to dealing with everybody reacting to their individuality that it makes it hard for them to kind of see the forest from the trees, if you know what I mean, as far as organizing stuff. Like, I don't know like that a lot of people have um, the idea of how important like a magazine about your scene is yeah, uh, or about, you know, your local area or things that are not getting here. Like this, this is seriously <clears throat> something that like if, if every artist had a real grasp about how this stuff works, they would all be starting their own magazines. No, they'd well, all be yeah. trying to do it. But um, it takes somebody like yourself to actually yeah bring everybody together and to be diplomatic and to show everybody in a way that it's not competing but you know it, it it's a really it's a really funny thing that um the way we look at art retrospectively no no totally well and that, that's because in know, 10 years like the stuff in this magazine might be the only proof that this stuff existed yeah well and like that's a big thing of it too is like part of with up is we i spend a stupid amount of time and money making sure the quality of the paper is very good because uh you know going back to like you know another magazine like sold where they they print it on newspaper quality you know you spill water on it, it's done it's just yeah. fucking destroyed versus this i mean you shouldn't you should take care of your magazine. It's not but, waterproof, guys. Yeah. But but you know, it's it's something that's like it'll survive. You know, it's a book in in essence. You it want is a book. your book to be able to survive a nuclear war. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what you want. You do you remember the old episode with um uh, what I forgot his name? You know where he's locked inside of the safe. Nuclear war takes place, and then he walks out, and everyone is he's an avid reader. Oh, he breaks his glasses. And yeah. at the end, he yeah, breaks yeah, yeah. his glasses. He's like, oh. That's a Twilight Zone, right? Bergman. In, what, what's his name? I forgot. It's a Twilight Zone episode, right? Yeah, yeah but Twilight. I forgot his name. But yeah. he was in a bunch of Twilight Zones. But, but yeah, yeah, no, this yeah. is a serious. This is a yeah. This yeah. is a thick I mean, this boy. Is his, Look at this yeah, guy. This is thick. That's our biggest you issue. Two hundred forty pages. Somebody. You know, you, you can do some one? damage. Well, the best is when I have to carry them around. Like Give we, me a good we hit. hold on. Yeah. Oh, hold yeah. on. I want people to see. Oh, there you go. That's the promo. Let's hear. Yeah, let's hear how. Hold on. What what an up magazine. No, 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 Give me a whack. No, 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 Okay. Buy Up Magazine is a, a weapon this, in this times of war. This shows you the dual purposes of Up Magazine. If someone tries to rob you, check this out. Watch this. If he wanted to, he could do some serious damage <laughs> He's to that magazine. Dead. It's got weight. We killed um, him. But no, that yeah, this issue in particular is about two pounds. When I have to do distributor sales and someone buys 30 and I have to carry it down the block <laughs> to the mailbox uh, or the yeah. post office. Yeah, it's it's heavy. It's a workout. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's it, it's pretty amazing stuff you got here. Like I, yeah. I think that you're, you know, a con artist was so successful because it filled a void mm -hmm. uh, that was really needed in the city. And I, I think the same about a magazine because yeah. I think that you're really, you're doing something that's needed that's not being done enough, which is covering the people who are here, um, inspired by all the stuff we read about. No, totally. You know, we're all here. We're all here trying to make it and, and contribute to it. And like these people are making cultural contributions and. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they don't get enough play and it really warms my heart to see something that uh, you know s shouts out and recognizes the work that all these artists are putting in no 100 percent, and that, that's a big part of it too it's like you know shining a light on the people who i think uh, deserve to have a light shine on them that they may not otherwise you know because mm. uh, like anything especially you know this is like a whole different thing we haven't discussed but uh up is an art magazine but the magazine side i've seen a lot of the media industry and you know uh there are a lot of magazines that are pay to play i mean yeah. i personally i'm not gonna there are a lot of galleries that are play to play oh yeah well you know, it's even um, like 
personally pay to play. Yeah, yeah. You have to pay Morgan if you, you want to play with him. And yeah. I can do a lot of things no, for but you. I'll, I'll even say like the Voyage LA, Voyage Miami. Like uh-huh. I know I got invited to do those too, uh-huh. where you have to like fill out the little questionnaire and they pretend like it's a real interview. Yeah. I'm not going to shit on any of the artists because I've seen a lot of people do it. But it does make me feel a way. I'm like, no, no, no. We have real writers. We curate real stories. We put in a lot of effort for it mm-hmm. versus these things that are basically vanity plays where it's like they have you do these little like five questions and pretend it's an interview. Yeah. And then they're like, all right, well, here's a free copy and you can buy a print version. Right. You know, uh, yeah. Canvas Rebels is another before. one of them. Dude, that is, I mean, it's the same thing, though, in the magazine world. And it, it's got, it makes sense it's the same. Yeah. Because the magazine world and the gallery world, artists both come to you for the same thing. Yeah, they yeah. think you're going to fucking pop them off. You're like, okay, this is the thing I'm going to get. This is this is the thing. No one no one understands the breadth of work over the years that goes oh, into totally. something actually popping off. But everybody comes to you because they want they think, oh, the interviewing up is going to get me famous. The, yeah. the show at Con Artist is going to get me famous or whatever. Uh, and that's something we do here, you know, that I'm I'm also very passionate about, which mm-hmm. is like understanding, speaking about, and changing for the better these models that have um, settled in gallery and in publication for yeah. artists. Like, you will go broke trying to buy the opportunities you're told. If you say yes to everything, yeah. uh, and like you got random people DMing you, being like, give me $150 to get <laughs> mentioned in this little thing, yeah, yeah. all day long. And, and all, non-artists do not know this pain. Yeah. They do not know the harassment we deal with. Like if you create anything creative, you're gonna have like seven people DMing you, try to get you to pay money to be a part of it. And yeah, uh, yeah. I've, I've always felt really strongly about that. And like Con Artist and Sola Studio, where I work now, a uh, big part of us is that we, we don't do that. Like no. any money you give us is going towards making things that happen in reality. And the, the idea of paying to be in the show or paying no, to totally. be in the feature, it sucks. Well, for me too, it it's, it. it's one of those things that, you know, we, I kind of, at first, the first two issues of Up, we didn't even have ads and it was all out of pocket. And then we yeah. basically almost fell apart because you do need some money. Yeah, you gotta but, have money. But but the line I kind of drew in the sand is I don't like taking money from artists. I'll, I don't mind taking it from brands. Yeah, uh, of course. You know, if you're a brand, sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll do an ad. Yeah. We could do, you know, some sponsored posts, whatever. That's what well, of artists, I I just feel sort of like uh, an ethical line. Like I don't really feel good about that. You know what I mean? And a lot of the artists you're going to want to cover won't be able to afford you anyway if you were trying to do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, like that's the other thing too. It's it's like a weird. Um, I don't know. It, it it's weird. But uh, I think part of it too. And again, back to sort of the industry aspect is you know everyone needs money to exist and like you look at like even like legacy publications the traditional advertorial model that most magazines and newspapers thrived on was absolutely decimated by social media and targeted Mm. ads which is why you see so few local papers which i think is like an integral part of communities uh you know give a shout out to bushwick daily i know alec the owner of that i know he like me has the struggles of making sure it works and runs but like local papers are important and like even like you see like you know earlier this year paper you know a lot of major magazines struggling because of the fact that yeah it's hard to make it work or you have like places like national geographic where they announce that they're not even going to do print anymore because of the fact that it's too expensive that's and national know? geographic that's a man. huge blow to collage artists <laughs> yeah <laughs> right you are personally you invested are, well, in yeah, the magazine no, no. industry actually, going away as a collage artist i made sure to stay away as much as possible from yeah. national geographic interesting Oh my God! Because you know, like you'll the see animals? the same. No, you see the same repeat clips. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because yeah. there's only so much printed matter, which there's a ton of. Yeah, yeah. But when it comes to collage, yeah. I mean, Nat 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 Geo yeah. would be the number one go-to, and then Life Magazine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then whatever, blah blah blah. Then, but uh, I've always tried to stay uh, very outside of that circle. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, uh, the way, what do you think about like the changing landscape? Like I personally love that you are putting together an art mag. Oh, totally. Well, and it was like even that conversation I have, the other art magazine, the dude's been doing it for 36 years. And like, you know, he was talking about how it's sort of hard and how, you know, these days people don't read as much. Even with us, you know, for, for every 10 magazines we sell, uh, you know, nine of those people look at the photos and like, oh, this is sick. And there's that one person who really reads it. And I write this magazine and I put this magazine together for that one person. Yeah. Because like, you know, our sales are good. Like we, we always, we've sold out basically every issue. Uh, and like we always do well. But yeah, some people put it on their coffee table and like they'll flip through it time to time. But like, it's a book. Like I, in the, how I curate the story, like the order of the stories, like there is, 
like if you follow it and i can even go into my whole philosophy of it but like there are like themes and elements and it's like a book where each that's very essay important, and each though. article is a chapter and there are people who read it cover to cover and like that's who i make this well for. It's, it's your curation yeah that makes this possible but but you know they would say the same thing about early mtv it, mm -hmm. it was the the curation of the people behind it that made it so popular yeah, yeah it's yeah. not just the the art and the writing it's the flow yeah of the art and the writing well, within it's, it's the publication it, yeah. totally right yeah and i think that uh, you know one thing i see a lot is um and, and a, a term that comes up when we talk a lot is like community yeah um curation these sort of things are getting now like super saturated yeah, yeah, yeah. it's become like a buzzword yeah, yeah like community is like literally falling apart as a concept in our world like you know people are, are coming to, i mean community has never be gone but like it is changing arguably mm -hmm. uh you know between like the literal people in your neighborhood to the people who you share interest with mm -hmm. and there's still an incredible crossover here because like a lot of people still move to new york because it's a center of art 100%. that's why i'm here that's why a lot of my friends are here as well mm -hmm. um but it, it is a really funny thing that you see people trying to like cheaply sell community cheaply yeah. sell this sort of idea community, of it. and i see you like actually at the show as you're yeah. actually there you're actually doing it you're on the ground with these artists uh you're talking to them your writing's insightful and i do think what you're creating here is like you know more than a magazine it's like yeah. an anthology of art history uh that will be like I, I think that it's it's hard to say how important it's going to be later in the future, but I see you you're the one doing it right yeah. now, and well, I'm so happy you're here. For I'll actually reason. say something exciting that happened to me this morning. We got reached out to by uh, EBSCO. I don't know if anyone here other than me has written a research paper, but uh, oh, it's yeah. basically a database, uh, mostly of academic journals and stuff like that. But if you've ever re written like a research paper, you've inevitably used EBSCO or one of the other variants. But they're basically these giant databases that hold a lot of uh, texts for people to research over time and for, you know, like academic research. And uh, they reached out to us because they want to include uh, up because they felt that. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah, it was cool. It's like one of those things that that's not going to mean anything to 99% of people. But as someone who wrote a research paper, not on art, on the politics of the Middle East, but like um, but as somebody who's like had to do those databases, was like, oh, that's really like flattering that it's like we are of importance enough that like, yeah, you want to include us in your database yeah. so that people who write papers on this will have our stories and such as like a point of reference. That's fucking you know? huge. That's, that's yeah, huge. Cool. Back in the day, like if you were really cool, you would, your article would be in microfiche. Microfiche? Yeah, microfiche. I don't know what that do is. What is it? Do you remember microfiche? You tell it's people tiny about little transparencies that would be the hit, like a catalog of all the newspapers or whatever, like everything, but it was shrunk. And it, would, it would go through this like oh, little machine cool. where it would magnify like something that was super small into like the yeah, total yeah, of the yeah. article. Yeah, yeah. But um, what would be the three buzzwords uh, for you in the last, just three, in the last few weeks? But what do you mean buzzwords that I want if to put out that I've yeah, heard? Yeah, that you want to put out. Three buzzwords, just three. Like, a, what's the goal of these buzzwords? Like, yeah. what is, like, do I want people to, like, find what these buzzwords words, or things yeah, I like, don't what, want to hear? What, what like, words are most, they don't have to, like, connect. They could be separate. Uh, okay. This is the difference between an artist brain and a writer brain. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's having a hard time parsing What, what is one. the intent of these buzzwords? Okay, so I'll say the intent of the buzzwords that I want people to think about, uh, I'll think about uh graffiti because that's what the issue that i've been thinking about a lot lately that's our next print i'll say uh art battle because we've got the grand finale for the 2023 nyc art league uh art battle coming up in a couple Ooh, weeks that's huge and then i'd say probably the buzzword that most people are probably thinking about at the moment is a uh, miami art basil because that's what everyone's fucking doing this week that's so, right that's yeah. right what about you headed what? down there i am headed down there i'm actually I've gone to Basel three or four other times, and I don't really love Miami, but this year I got invited to talk on a panel at the Museum of Graffiti because I, uh, I wrote an essay for Mana Contemporary's new graffiti book, um, which is pretty exciting. It was cool to like, I've obviously written a lot for Up, but it's always nice as a writer when your stuff gets published somewhere else too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I do a little writing myself. I've written for Quiet Lunch Magazine a oh, couple yeah, yeah. times. I've written for my own blog here at Solus as well. But I, I think that the big takeaway from for this interview, for this idea, talking about magazines versus artists and stuff mm -hmm. is like, really, you guys are doing the work that uh, is 
uh, often like you know not thought about enough or or not you know it's it's the stuff that you put down gets cataloged gets archived gets you know put into that um that archive of, of um uh, source material for sort of research papers yeah like this is how you make history and like you're not going to make you're gonna make history as an artist, but like you know, you you should be getting out there more. You should be like interacting with people because when you meet somebody like yourself, who's really got this interest for you know reasons other than just blowing up, getting yeah. big, getting a bunch of money. You care about this stuff, and it's pretty obvious it comes through in your writing and in your publication. Yeah. So I just want to thank you again for well, coming. Yeah, today thank you. Thank you very us. much. And I, I forgot to ask you, what are your yeah. what are your three buzzwords? My three buzzwords. Yeah. What about you? I fucking hate buzzwords. <laughs> Buzzwords are the worst. That's it. When, when, okay, when I saw call something a buzzword, my first like it's, that's a very dismissive title. Yeah, that's why when you asked really? me, I was like, my, yeah. my first thought is like, okay, what's the bullshit of yeah, the week? Bullshit. Like that's what I think about buzzword. A buzzword. There's a punchline. No, buzzword means bullshit. No, 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 no. There's a punchline. Oh, oh. Oh, you're trying to set up a joke. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm doing doing it really it slow. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know. Um, I, you're the worst. I am the worst. <laughs> Buzzwords. Joke fucking okay. fell flat. All right, Joe Rogan, Israel, and <laughs> <laughs> Joe Rogan, Israel, Trump. There you go. J- they're all three in the same. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say Lucky Tom Explosion, but you like. <gasps> I know you, 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 wow. you like. I know. I, it was like a, either that or Morgan Jesse Lappin, but I was gonna go with Lucky Tom Explosion. Uh, I swear. No, no, no. I swear you it was gonna be Lucky Tom. self-promoting hack. <laughs> But you know he does promote. That's right. You, you got to do it. If you're an artist, promote your show seriously. We will. Your curator yeah. will thank you, and the people that buy your stuff will thank you. Yeah. But I want to thank you guys for joining us for this episode. If you are in New York and you're interested in art at all, you need to get a subscription to Up. Say what's up to TK at your local art battle, uh, and come out here. We out here. We doing this. We do the things. We do the things. We do nice things with people. Thank you for watching. Come be a part of it.